Welcome to Skating Key Productions. I'm Crown Grey's Cocon. Let's get into the video. In today's video, we're going to be asking the question of what if Hitler never declared war on the United States? On the 11th of December 1941, four days after Pearl Harbor, Hitler made a speech in Berlin in which he outlined the reasons why he was declaring war on the United States. Now, a lot of people, a lot of historians, they've acted as if it was like some big surprise, like, like Hitler just kind of randomly was like, oh, like yeah, Japan's going to war with, with America, let's also go to war with America. And actually, to, to watch that speech, which I'll like put a, a link in the description, it outlines all of the different reasons. Now, Hitler, obviously, within that, there's a huge, huge uh, amount of hypocrisy. He talks about like international law and international order and like people breaking promises and it's like, well, dude, you just invaded the whole of Europe and whatever, like you were complaining about the Americans for pretty trivial things. And he didn't, you don't actually believe in international law, but whatever, like kind of, yeah, also as well, of course, for Hitler, the Jews are behind it all, like you know, the Jews are behind Roosevelt, the Jews are behind, it, you know, whatever. So that's typical Hitler. What's interesting within that speech is that there's a kernel of truth in it, yeah. And that's the fact that Roosevelt, you know, FDR, he was very much in favour of getting in America into the war in Europe because he recognised that Hitler was the, the chief threat against the American people. However, the American people were very, very isolationist yeah, up until Pearl Harbour. And it took until Pearl Harbor happened before they wanted to get involved in the war. This is something which has kind of been underplayed, yeah, like a lot, a lot, because people kind of forget now, now that they have the benefit of hindsight, they now recognise how big of a threat Hitler was in comparison to Imperial Japan. However, there have been certain myths that have been kind of propagated within this, and hopefully this, this video is gonna uh, undo some of this. One is how central of a role the United States played within the war. Don't take offense to this Americans, but us included, like the Western Front with small potatoes in the grand scheme of things. There's also the myth with regard to the so-called like Europe first uh, strategy. People have overstated how much focus the American like military put into the European uh, theatre as opposed to the uh, Pacific theatre they tend to have said this kind of like 90-10 kind of thing like this kind of general consensus. I'm also going to uncover some of the mythology about who like the Americans kind of thought were their biggest threat because even deep into the war yeah you could ex you could excuse it at the early stages of the war but even like deep deep into the war when people were asked who's the biggest threat in hindsight we now know because of how strong Nazi Germany was because of all the things that he did with regard to the Holocaust etc etc we now recognize that they were a greater evil and that Roosevelt was right in that regard however we're gonna dispel some of the myths by looking at some of the stats on that so Stay tuned for the rest of this video. Now straight off the bat, we have to talk about the big thing, which is how much of an impact did America have in the European theater? Well, to put it this way, so you had the Lend-Lease uh, program, which was you know before America's entry to the war, and obviously uh, like, uh, was ramped up even more once they were in it. And this was sending uh, money, sending arms, uh, sending like kind of uh, new technology and stuff to Britain and later to the Soviet Union when they got involved in the war. As we discussed in our previous video on Operation Unthinkable, so definitely check that out. There's a lot of overlap with, with in this section. People have said that without Lend-Lease. The Soviet Union's like their army would have wouldn't have been able to feed itself. It wouldn't have been able to win the war. It was decisive, etc. Certainly, a lot of the food, a lot of the jeeps, a lot of the um, uh, radio equipment, etc. A lot of the, the the radar that they had. A lot of these things were given to them by the Americans, and it would have been more difficult for the Soviets to have won without this aid. At the same time, we have to recognise that the Soviet Union caused get this eighty eight percent of German casualties in the war. Not just since Barbarossa, throughout the whole war, right? So the, from 1939, so the stats are even like more skewed towards the Soviets if you include like the period from, from Barbarossa onwards, yeah. All the campaigns on the Western Front in, in 1940, all the like campaigns of like liberation in 44 and 45, all of what was happening in North Africa, all of that meant nothing, yeah? in comparison to the conflict that took place on the Eastern Front. Because the Soviets and the Germans were engaged in a war of annihilation and it was a war of like, it was a total, total war. There wasn't any kind of niceties, there wasn't any kind of mercy. It was a war of either this side wins and annihilates the other or the other side wins. It was a very, very bloody conflict. 
And so this is something that we kind of have to bear in mind. Like when we think about the impact that um, like America had, if we recognize that the Soviets killed more than seven times as many people as the Americans and the entire British Empire combined, the impact is, is, is huge. With that being said, how much of an impact did America really have in military terms? Probably not a lot. And I think that, yes, like they obviously, their contributions sped up the, the war. And I think it would have been more difficult uh, for the Soviets to eventually won that war. But the Soviets would have won that war, let's be real. So would the war have ended in 1945? Again, probably not. Probably it would have ended maybe, let's say, 1946, maybe early, maybe late. At very, very best, 1947, like at a complete stretch. But I think what would have happened is in the post-war world is that without American troops, uh, especially like uh, post-D-Day, uh, that's when the Americans really started ramping up the amount of uh, troops they had in, in Europe. I think that the liberation of Western Europe, which we saw in our timeline, would have been a lot slower. And I think that the the British by themselves, you know, the British Empire and like some, uh, some of the other fighters uh, such as, you know, the, the Free Polish, like the Free French, etc., etc., I think they would have been able to liberate Italy, France, the Low Countries, and I think that's probably it. Maybe some Scandinavian countries if they decide to go out on a limb and take them. But I think that rather than the Allies and the Soviets meeting on the River Elbe, as in our timeline, I think that that meeting probably would have been somewhere closer to, to the Rhine River, yeah, so much, much further west. In the post-war world would have extended Soviet influence far, far uh, deeper into the continent than was otherwise the case. And now we have to talk about the second big myth which has to be bust, which is the uh, over-focus of the Americans in the so-called Europe First uh, policy. This Europe First policy, this Europe First strategy, it's been overhyped. There's been many reasons why it's kind of been overhyped. If you think about like World War II, we all kind of know the war in Europe, you know, when we think about, you know, the Holocaust, we think about like kind of like how bad the Nazis were, you know, Hollywood has really kind of like uh, added to this um, so not even talking from a British perspective here just talking about the American perspective considering that America joined the war because of the, like, the, the, the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor the p war in the Pacific is relatively a forgotten war in the grand scheme of things so it's a combination of a shift of hindsight perspective and second of all during the war uh, the public opinion was very much on the side of a Japanese first uh, policy a Pacific first policy. Now the United States even before joining the war was prepared for it. Certain like generals and of course FDR was very much planning for this kind of like that like, two theater conflict yeah where you have troops be able to fight in the Pacific and in Europe yeah simultaneously. They obviously understood that like, people on both sides of the ocean needed to be dealt with and so as early as 1940 the the, the US Navy uh, like kind of already had like clear plans of how they were going to kind of conduct this war. In 1941 to 1942, within that winter there, so shortly after Pearl Harbor, there was a meeting known as the Arcadia Conference in which the British and the Americans met and it, there they, they tried to devise where should the focus be? Should the focus be more on fighting the Japanese or should the focus be more on fighting Hitler? At this moment in time, a lot of people in the American camp were still very much bitter about Pearl Harbor and were very much on we need to crush like the Japanese. This is kind of the beginning of this myth of this kind of like 90 to, to 10 like kind of like ratio. Fleet Admiral Ernst King, he complained uh, to FDR that actually the, the balance was was too far off. At very, very least, it should be a 70% ratio to 30%. Uh, so 70% in Europe and 30% in the Pacific where actually in fact it was 85% to Europe and 15% in the Pacific. How true is this really? When we drill down into the data of this, we realised that actually this is nonsense, yeah? Because if we were to go by what Ernst King was saying, yeah, like no disrespect to them, he's probably, you know, if your family watch whatever, like your ancestors watch him, I'm not, you know, but just think of, this is kind of where that myth kind of like originated, so we're just gonna tackle the myth itself. The myth doesn't have much basis because if we were to believe it, then the assumption would be that without Hitler declaring war, then the Japanese war would have been over, what, 
five, maybe six times quicker than it was in our timeline. So instead of it taking four years, the, the Americans would be able to beat them in like, well, much less than a year. This kind of doesn't really bear out of any kind of thing because, and to be honest, when I first started doing the, 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 this video, when I started doing research for this, I'd always been talk, told this kind of this, this Europe first like strategy, this kind of this myth. And so I always kind of thought, when I first started planning for this video, I assumed that, you know, America would be able to knock Japan out very, very quickly. But when we drill down to, into the actual data, we see that this is completely off. And the reason why it's completely off is mainly to do with US public opinion. Now, US public opinion, just to get our heads around this, yeah, the US public are isolationist. There are lots of people within the German American Bund. Um, there was the people within the uh, American Nazi party, etc. There's a large like American German community there, as we discussed in other videos. German Americans are actually technically the biggest ethnicity within the United States even today. So let alone what it was back then. There was a lot of people who were instinctively kind of like, well, okay, cool. And also as well going to war with the Italians. It was like, hey, you know, like there's obviously a lot of like Italian Americans. There's also before like the, 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 the true extent of the true horror of the Holocaust were really revealed to people. So while obviously you did have the, the Jewish community there who were anti-Hitler, like a lot of people there didn't really care. And also there was quite a lot of anti-Semitism still in America in those days. Public opinion wasn't as firmly shifted towards fighting Hitler as we might imagine. And we, this really shows, even in 1943, Gallup did a poll and they found that when it was asked to the American people, who do you think your chief enemy are? 53% said Japan, only 34% said Germany. So this again gives her idea of even after all of this, people are still more likely to say Japan is the bigger enemy than Germany as late as like, you know, the winter of 1943. This is partly tied into the racism of the time. We obviously know about the Japanese American internment camps where the Japanese population uh, within America were basically all rounded up and sent to like literal like concentration camps that are not death camps, obviously, but by any definition, they're concentration camps, they're internment camps. When people were asked, which of the enemy are crueler by heart? By 82%, they said that Japanese people were crueler by heart than Germans. This again ties in with this kind of racism. Yes, I know that the Japanese were very cruel to prisoners of war and they committed many, many atrocities, etc. So one could at the time be forgiven for it because again, the true horrors of the Holocaust hadn't been revealed. But it again gives you this kind of perspective of American public opinion was fervently, fervently anti-Japanese. Like the fact that Hitler kind of dragged them into the war. From an American perspective, they're like, huh, what? We just wanted to fight the Japanese, like this kind of, so that's why it's been a baffling thing, especially for many Americans, because they're like, why did this dude want to declare war on us? As we said, the Americans under FDR have been doing lend lease. They've been capturing uh, German uh, submarines and, and merchant uh, shipping. Everything uh, that the Americans had done up until the declaration of war, it was pretty clear that they weren't being a neutral country. It was pretty clear that they were doing everything short of actually declaring war on Germany, they were, they were even like cap you know, blowing up and capturing like kind of like German vessels. I mean, short of declaring war, what else are you really going to be doing to them? Just to really expose how much of a myth this is, again, let's focus on 1943 and what the troop levels were like, what the like levels of planes, the levels of ships, everything. How much were the resources skewed in one way or the other? How close were we to this kind of like, like at, at very least this kind of like 85, 15% like ratio? So what we find is that in December, of 1943 in the pacific front there were 1.87 million u.s troops there were 7,900 planes and there were 700 ships but in europe there was 1.81 million 8,800 planes and there were 500 ships so actually what we find is that the the statistics on this kind of show that actually there was 51 percent of american troops like american service people who were like fighting in pacific you had 47 percent of all u.s planes fighting in the pacific and you had 58 percent of u.s ships fighting in the pacific so to put it like quite bluntly this 85 15 percent uh, ratio is a complete myth because even as late as december 1943 when you know like D-Day's not even that, D-Day's in like six months time from this year, right? And you can see that it's 
at very least 50-50. And actually for the first six months of the war, three times as many American troops were sent to the Pacific front than were sent to the European front. So again, this gives you a, a real perspective on this. So all the, the, the losses that America had uh, in the first six months, all the gains, et cetera, et cetera, that was still with America putting three times as many troops into that front than they were in the European front. Really kind of get this notion out of your head that the, the, the American war efforts were really focused on Europe and that the Pacific was a side campaign. For the Americans, it was the war. It was the war for a long, long time. Okay, so you might think, okay, maybe it gets a bit more balanced as the wars goes on. Maybe it gets more balanced by like 1945, by the war's end, you know, May 1945, hopefully it's all kind of like a bit more balanced. Well, it is to some degree, because by May of 1945, you had a situation where 78% of US Army and US Air Force uh, like personnel combined were in Europe, and only 22% in the Pacific. So if you want to stop the pressures there, you're going to be disappointed, because when we add in the Navy and the Marine Corps, who are obviously very significant as well, we find that actually the balance goes 70% in the Pacific and 30% in Europe. So even by May of 1945, it's still this kind of rough parity. Yes, you've got more army and, and, and air force, but in the Pacific front, you've got more uh, Navy and you've got more like Marine Corps, right? So they're obviously like fight, they're fighting soldiers that like, you know, amphibious like landings, et cetera, et cetera. So it still is this kind of balance. So even as late as 1945, this 85, like 15% myth is, is, it's just, it's completely unfounded. I don't think at any point in the whole war does it, is it even close to, to being that. It, throughout most of the war, the Americans are pretty much, like roughly speaking, about 50 50 yes it might be more skewed one way in one year and more skewed another way in another year but throughout most of the war to uh, to say that america put all of its eggs into one basket is just silly and it doesn't really bear out in any like real uh, detail but i'll tell you what does it bear out in detail the comment section you got to hit me up with more comments you got to say what's good about the video what you liked about it what you didn't like what things i missed out because obviously i'm going to miss out some things in these videos and also as well hit the like button destroy that like button you know destroy that like button like you know declare war on that like button even i want you to declare war on that like, like button okay go to war with it yeah hit it like or even just slightly tap it like just do whatever you need drop a nuke on it even yeah drop a nuke on it yeah do hiroshima on on that like button okay or maybe not that, that's a bit much. But either way, just tap the like button because we're trying to get to 20 likes per video. That might not sound like a lot, but it really does help the algorithm for, for the channel. So if you wouldn't mind, I've obviously done a lot of research into doing this. Um, and also as well, check out a lot more of our other videos uh, within the alternative uh, history uh, playlist. Uh, a lot of them are going to be based on like Cold War, the World War II, you know, and there's also going to be some other ones as well. So and we already have some out. So definitely check those out. Stay tuned for more. Subscribe if you haven't. And yeah, back to the rest of the video. Ah. So in conclusion, the war was not an American war. Okay, I know Hollywood has made you think that America was completely pivotal in the war and that if Hitler didn't declare war, somehow like the whole world was going to, you know, that like Hitler was going to take over. No, like kind of like America's contribution was very valid. It was a thing where it definitely sped it up and it's not to take anything away from the Americans. However, you know, as much as they had industrial might, military might, as much as, you know, it's a thing where in reality, they kind of joined the, the war too late and they clearly were focused on two fronts at once, pretty much 50-50. So maybe if they'd like decided actually we are going to stick to this european first uh, strategy maybe the war in europe would have been over much sooner because i think that japan expanded very very quickly but then like well it just was a bunch of islands and like yeah they had some territories and stuff but they were lightly defended and it's a thing of they, they stretched themselves over a huge huge area and i think that 
you probably could have defeated them with this so-called like kind of like 90 like 10 ratio it might have taken a slightly longer but i think that it still could have been done and i think the war in europe was the present thing it's not just because i'm i live within like, like like the continent of europe as such it's a thing where no hitler was the bigger threat hitler there was no way that like like japan was going to expand past what it already had yeah like it really like reached its peak whereas nazi germany could have really realistically taken over the world or at very least a huge huge chunk of it like in the long run fdr was right on this he was 100 percent right because Hitler posed a much bigger threat, not just because of obviously the Holocaust and everything that we know about Hitler, like in hindsight, yeah, of just how like evil he was. It's also a thing of on a strategic level, it wouldn't have been in America's interest. America could survive with you know the Far East being controlled by Japan, but a Germany controlling Europe, controlling the Middle East, controlling Africa would have been much, much more of a threat to American interests and American foreign policy. And Yes, like kind of, I, I, so I think that if only this 85, uh, 15 or this 90, 10 uh, myth was actually real, then the war in Europe probably would have been over much, much sooner. And I think that the Soviets wouldn't have been able to take as much. And I think that once that war was take, was dealt with, once like Hitler kind of was dealt with like much quicker, America could then have focused and, on taking out Japan at their leisure. But hopefully with this video and some of the stats we've shown, we've kind of like put a dent in that myth. Now, now I, please Americans, please don't get really triggered by this. Please don't get offended. I'm not saying that you didn't do anything in this war, I'm not dis diminishing what you lot did at all. It's just a thing of humble yourself i'm british as well we were fighting for the entire war and yet we didn't like make anywhere near as much of a dent as the soviets who joined two years later but anyway so yeah with that being said have a great day and also stay tuned for our next video which is going to be what if britain and france actually invade germany so the first one is going to be 1935 with the uh, remilitarization of the rhineland the second one is going to be with the invasion of the rest of Czechoslovakia. So this is after the Sudeten crisis. This is when in March 1939, uh, when like Hitler took the rest of Czechoslovakia. And then the third one is going to be with the invasion of Poland. So if British and French troops actually attacked on the Western Front, instead of just sitting there uh, kind of in the so-called Sitzkrieg or the so-called phony war and just let like Poland be completely destroyed if they had actually acted in the in that time how might the war have gone differently in each of those three points so stay tuned for that and obviously stay tuned for many more and that being said have a great day and bye